Hey people, what's happening? We're heading into chapter two of Read and Disagree, Managing Conflict. I'd say one of the most intimate chapters, certainly the most revealing of all the topics. It's funny how next week we'll be talking about let's get it on, talking about sex and intimacy. And I would even say how we deal with chapter two on conflict will really inform how we deal with chapter three on intimacy. Gottman even says that conflict is the greatest opportunity for growth and intimacy. So I want us just to breathe a little, think a little, that we may be headed into almost like a, a rethinking on our understanding of conflict. Gottman goes on to say that mutual understanding is the healthiest, most productive goal of all conflict. So let me just say that again, that what's the goal of conflict? Mutual understanding. It's like job one, when conflict comes up, what's job one? Mutual understanding. I hear you, you hear me. Job one, I get you, you get me. Job one, I see you, you see me. Mutual understanding is the number one goal of all conflict. I've got a question for you. Where do you go with conflict? Where do you go with conflict? Where do you take it? Where does it end up going when you're involved in conflict? St. Isaac of Syria, 6th century, is known to have said, to see yourself as you really are is a miracle greater than raising the dead. If we put it in our context on this topic of conflict, to see yourself on how you actually handle conflict, how, for you to see how you do conflict, is a miracle greater than raising the dead. And that's where I want us to go. I want us to go into the miracle. I want us to go into integrating our Orthodox faith in that call to self, humble self-reflection where we could take a look. How do I show up with conflict? What happens when conflict arises in my life? Very often, as we get a clearer look on how we handle conflict, where we go with it, it'll tell the story of our personality. It'll tell the story of how others perceive us. It'll tell the story of why certain relationships have gone the way they have. And then as we reflect on where we go with conflict, we could do that as a couple. Where do we go with conflict? And that, too, will tell the story of what goes on, where we go, where we don't go. This area of conflict really can shape the direction of our marriages. So answering that question of where do you go with conflict is a very personal one, has a bunch of personal answers. We're familiar with fight, flight, and frozen. Research shows us that some of us will go into fight mode when it's time for conflict, kind of a pit bull, mm, can't let it go. Conflict is only over when I can declare myself the winner. Others might be more turtle-like, where we avoid, and that's our gut response to conflict, where others, their whole body chemistry changes, they get paralyzed, and that's the frozen mode, where it's all about just surviving that interaction and not really engaging in it. Whether you're a fight or a flight or a frozen or something in between, we'll be taking a look at managing conflict in a healthy way. We also keep in mind that part of our insight to reflect on where we go with conflict does connect with the emotional classroom we grew up in. If we think about how did dad handle conflict? How did mom do conflict? That is the emotional classroom where we were handed the curriculum of what to do or not to do in times of conflict, in times of differences. And keep in mind, some of you have little ones running around the house. Others of you are planning on it, Lord willing. And so whatever curriculum was handed to us, we have that vulnerability of passing on that same emotional curriculum to our kids. So we press that pause button. We take a breath. We do reflect that how we look at this whole area of conflict is really important for our personal lives, for our marriages, and for our families in the generations to come. You know, it occurs to me that you all having opportunity, in a sense, to step back, read about 
addressing conflict and to discuss what's going on in your own marriage actually puts you in a higher percentile of success because very often most couples don't step out of their cycle of conflict. So this gives us opportunity to reflect, to think about how we're doing it and what we could be learning to do it differently. There's a portion at the end of this chapter that Gottman calls fight fair and repair. And what he's getting at is kind of interesting. I see it usable in a couple ways, but what he's getting at is when we have a conflict that doesn't go so well, he calls it a regrettable incident. And he says, when you've had that regrettable incident, he recommends we follow the five steps to bring a real connection, resolve, and direction so that we can make all our course corrections. What he gets at there is in step one is to share what it felt like for you during that conflict. And both people share what the emotions were. It felt fearful, it felt, I felt worried, I felt uh, panicky, I felt defensive, I felt lonely, that each person would share. Now notice, sharing that is a bit vulnerable, which really starts to to do the leaning in, the, the turning in versus turning away. And the turning away is what most people do in times of conflict. So sharing that feeling, number one. Number two is to share your perspective and the other person validates it. Sounds simple. And in a sense it is, but very often we get triggered right off course. So we share our perspective. Now remember, the perspective is often different. And so this is the opportunity to hear the different perspective, but notice we validate that different perspective. What I, I tend to use the word acknowledge their perspective. I, and you've heard me say this before, uh, some of you, where I talk about the two A words that couples mix up that lead to horrible, <laughs> unresolved conflict. So it's just like this where he uses the word validate, I'll use the word acknowledge. And what we mix up is the word acknowledge and the word agree. And most couples think they have to agree on every point to be able to move forward. And that's not what we're looking for. And even research shows that we don't have to be agreeing to get along. But acknowledging is, I'm gonna acknowledge your experience, I'm gonna acknowledge your point of view. And in so doing, I respect it. And agreeing is for somebody else on some other day because what we often do if we go the agree model is I'll listen up to the point I disagree, then I'll roll my eyes or then I'll interrupt and then I'll correct you and all that big mess. So step two is to share your perspective and the other person acknowledge that perspective to validate. Step three, interesting point on step three, and that is to share triggers. If in the course of the regrettable incident, something felt triggered from the past, then you might, it doesn't happen in every regrettable incident, but it's a good insight to have. When you share that, wow, you know, when you ran late, I got angry at you, but I have to tell you, I've got issues with abandonment, and so I started believing you were abandoning me, and therefore I had that big reaction. So we share the trigger, again, very vulnerable. We lean in, we trust has to be a safe place, people, back and forth. We provide safety in hearing what might be that deeper trigger and that opportunity for healing. So that's step three. Step four is accepting responsibility. I put in parentheses for your part. So many of us fall into all or nothing thinking, and so we're afraid to accept responsibility as if to think, that if I do, then it's gonna be seen as all me, and I know it's not all me, so I won't, so then I, I, I'm not gonna do the all, so then I'll do the nothing. And then we have a stalemate. And so the accepting responsibilities, find your part. Hey, I got rude, I, I, got, I took that tone, I, I got angry, I got loud, I, I brought up your mother, what, whatever that is, you own your part. Accept responsibility for your part in step, that was step four, and step five is then discuss back and forth, out of that little cycle that, that you guys are reflecting on, what do you find that you'll choose to do differently the next time? So I think these five steps are super useful. I think that those ingredients, not only to reflect on a regrettable incident, but keep those ingredients in mind 
going into any conversation when you start noticing differences arise, be looking for the way in which you share feelings, but then you also share and hear the perspective of the other and validate and so on. So let's think about these five steps. You'll have opportunity to discuss them. I hope you find them useful. I know I do. Thanks. You know that I'll always be there, baby, I swear, to my days on this earth.